tutorial, we're going to talk about ray traced ambient occlusion. We'll discuss how to turn it on and what settings are available for adjusting the appearance and performance of the effect in Unreal. Before going over the implementation in Unreal, it's important to understand what ambient occlusion is and how it works. So first we'll go over that. We'll also talk about screen space ambient occlusion, the technique most commonly used in games before real-time ray tracing was available. Then we'll jump into Unreal, turn on ray traced ambient occlusion, and take a look at the settings available for tweaking the effect. Ambient occlusion is the measurement of how much ambient light is occluded or blocked by an object in its surroundings. Even when not in direct light, objects in the scene receive some ambient light because light bounces around. However, some areas of the scene, such as crevices, corners, and tight spaces, receive less ambient light because the light is blocked or occluded. The occlusion can be caused by the object occluding itself or by other objects nearby. Ambient occlusion for get any given point can be calculated by casting rays out in a hemisphere away from the point. If none of the rays hit anything, there's no occlusion. If all the rays hit something, the point is considered fully occluded. If only a portion of the rays hit something, the point is partially occluded, so the percentage of rays that hit something determine how occluded the point is. The more rays you send out, the more accurate the calculation is. Here are some examples of what ambient occlusion looks like. Notice that corners, crevices, and tight spaces are darker than flat and open areas. This data can be multiplied with the ambient light in the scene to create more realistic looking lighting. Now, as you might imagine, this calculation can be quite expensive, especially with a large number of rays. Before hardware that supported ray tracing, it wasn't possible to do this at all. Instead, game developers created a technique called Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, or SSAO, to roughly approximate ambient occlusion. SSAO reconstructs the scene using the depth buffer. For each pixel on the screen, it samples the depth buffer of the surrounding pixels to try to determine if the current pixel should be occluded. If neighboring pixels are closer to the viewer, they're considered as occluders. This technique is relatively fast to compute on modern graphics hardware, but there are several issues and artifacts. The depth buffer records the distance from the camera for each pixel, but it doesn't know if there's empty space between a foreground object and an object behind. So it often thinks an object is occluded by another object when in reality, that object is just in front. Similarly, when an object is above another object, the object underneath should be occluded, but this is often missed by SSAO. Let's jump into Unreal and I'll demonstrate these issues. All right, so here we are in Unreal, and the first thing that I wanna show you is those artifacts from using screen space ambient occlusion. So I'm gonna come over here to the lit menu and under buffer visualization, I'm gonna pick the ambient occlusion option. And what this is gonna do is show us just the ambient occlusion component of the rendering. So I'll switch that on and you can see I've got my ambient occlusion uh, showing. Now, the setting right now is set for it to be pretty subtle. It's set to an intensity of 0.44. And this may be what I wanna keep for my scene but in order to be able to tweak things and show you what's going on, I'm gonna turn this intensity up to one. And what this setting does is it just increases the contrast of my ambient occlusion and makes the minimum value go all the way down to, one, to zero or black. All right, so with that said, I can show you some of these artifacts. First of all, right around this pole, you can see that there's kind of a dark halo. And that's caused by the ambient occlusion not knowing that there's empty space behind the pole. So it thinks that these points right next to the pole on the floor are occluded by the pole, but they're really not. So 
This is kind of one of the weaknesses of ambient occlusion, and it, it especially happens um, back here farther deeper into the scene where there are all these poles. Uh, you can see how it's kind of dark back here when it really shouldn't be. Another issue is underneath this seat here on the left. Uh, right here underneath the seat, it really should be dark because the seat is included, occluding uh, the floor underneath it. Um, but screen space ambient occlusion doesn't catch that because the bottom of the seat is not there because the screen space ambient occlusion is only looking at what's on the screen and it's not seeing the bottom of this seat. So that doesn't work. Now, how do we solve this? Well, we use ray traced ambient occlusion. So if I come over here to my settings, I have my post process volume selected and that has all my settings for the post process effects, including ambient occlusion. You can see I have ambient occlusion here, intensity, radius, uh, enabled and samples per pixel. These are the settings that we're going to go over today. So the first thing that I'm going to do is click the enable checkbox and turn it on. And right away you can see that the issues I brought up are solved. So if I look at the sides of this pole, there's no black halo behind the pole. And also this seat here, you can see there's some nice occlusion happening underneath the seat. And that's because with ray tracing, I'm not just using the depth buffer to render the ambient occlusion, I'm actually tracing rays into the scene and they're allowed to bounce around and hit things that I'm not that are not actually visible on the screen. So that's really cool. There's a really nice ad advantage uh, for using ray tracing for ambient occlusion. All right, let's go over the settings. So we already talked about intensity. I can dial the intensity down and basically that reduces the contrast and make things significantly lighter. This is a setting that you probably want to turn down and not leave at one uh, for the final version, but when you're tweaking the other settings, it really helps to have intensity set to one so that you can actually see what's going on. All right, the next setting that we have here is radius. I talked about sending rays out in a hemisphere and this radius controls the maximum length that the rays will go before they give up. Um, so if a ray goes longer than 55 centimeters, it's just gonna say, well, I didn't hit anything, so that's that. <laughs> if I were to increase this radius, what you're gonna see is that the scene is gonna get a lot darker because more and more of the rays actually start hitting things. And at some point, the rays on the floor, for example, are gonna go all the way up and hit the ceiling and basically all the rays are gonna hit things because I'm inside this train car and they have things that they can hit. So you're gonna to wanna to be careful to not take this up too high or you're basically just gonna get all kinds of false positives with your rays hitting things that are really far away. All right, so I'm gonna dial this back down and you can see that as I'm reducing it, the scene is getting lighter as the rays stop at the limit that I've given them. I'm just gonna set this back to 55 like it was. Uh, you can also go lower than this, but if I do end up going lower than this, you can see some of the essential parts of the scene get lost. So you can see, for example, I no longer have the nice ambient occlusion that I needed here under the seat. So you have to kind of find a nice balance between um, too long uh, rays and rays that are too short. Now, the shorter your rays are, the better your performance will be. And so you wanna kind of find that sweet spot between performance and uh, nice image quality. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set this back to uh, 55 centimeters for my ray radius. All right, there is one more setting that I wanna set, and that's this one here, it's samples per pixel. Now, when I was talking about ambient occlusion before, I said that rays were sent out in a hemisphere all around the, the pixel on the screen that I'm currently rendering. Well, if I'm only sending out one ray per pixel, how am I able to uh, create a hemisphere with that? Well, the way that that works is using a technique called temporal accumulation. So what happens is every frame, it shoots out a ray in a different direction in that hemisphere. And all of those frames are accumulated or added up over time uh, to create the effect that we need. So after 30 or 40 frames, we have enough rays 
that they've gone in all directions in that hemisphere and we can calculate a good value. Now you can see that happening as I move around the scene. As I move, the, same, the scene is really grainy, but as soon as I stop and hold still for a minute, things resolve and that graininess goes away and I get the effect that I'm looking for. It's a pretty cool way of saving performance by sending out as few rays per pixel as possible but then adding them up over time to, to get a better effect. Now you can kind of see if I look into these areas that are occluded how there's a bit of grain and it's kind of animated and moving around. And I can fix that if I increase my samples per pixel. I'm just gonna come over here and set this to 32. And you can see that immediately it gets really smooth. Now I don't know if because of the YouTube compression you're gonna be able to tell the difference if I set it to one versus 32. To my eye, the 32 is really smooth and soft and and the one is, is a little bit grainy and kind of swimming. Um, however, if you leave this on 32, it's gonna really hurt your performance. So you're gonna to need to find a nice balance between uh, high quality and uh, performance again. A lot of what we do in computer graphics is limited by or controlled by trying to find that balance between it looking really nice uh, and performing really well. And I'd recommend for this one, samples per pixel, that you just leave it at one frame a second. Now I was talking about the intensity and how you'd want to turn up the intensity uh, for editing things and then once you got the look that you want dialed in to turn the intensity down. And what I want to do now is show you what that looks like. So I currently have our intensity turned all the way up to one and I'm just gonna slide this down. And as I slide it, you can see that the scene just kind of uh, slowly gets brighter. Here it is set to one and here it is set to zero. And I'm just gonna set it to like 4.1. I think that's, that's a pretty good setting. It's not, uh, creating a lot of really dark areas in the scene, but it is providing some nice, subtle ambient inclusion the way that I'd like it to be. All right, that concludes our tutorial for today. I hope you enjoyed it and that you learned a few things about real-time ray traced ambient occlusion. Next week, we're gonna talk about real-time ray traced reflections, and that's gonna be a great one. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know as soon as that video goes live. It should be next Thursday. I try to release these uh, at least once a week. So thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you next week.